with microscopy using AI and ML and generally taking another step back, a higher level perspective. I want to get your, your thoughts on what improvements automated microscopy could make to the field of material science in terms of accelerating innovation? That's a fantastic question. So again, there are roughly two mechanisms that drive the innovation. One is the curiosity. So a lot of real level one science is actually driven by the curiosity. Some of it is driven by the need when we have the target application. So practically the target application is much more effective driving force. Great example here would be Hey everyone, welcome to the It's a Material World podcast. I'm your host, Puneet. David, my co-host, is joining alongside me today. How's it going, David? Pretty good. Yeah, I'm in the sunny city of San Diego today on a trip. But no, it's it's definitely good. But maybe we can jump right into the intro here and the recap, but... Yeah, we had Dr. Sergey on from the University of Knoxville, Tennessee. What were your thoughts about our conversation? I thought it was super in-depth and just throughout the experience, just learning about just how impressive his background is. I mean, over 700 publications, and I think that was only at like, you know, a midway portion of his career is just very impressive. And we really dove into uh, the fields of microscopy and how to potentially leverage artificial intelligence and machine learning to truly advance the field and really, you know, accelerate materials development as well as materials analysis. So I just thought it was interesting. I think one intriguing question was, you know, microscopy is classically envisioned on a 2D plane. So I asked the question of, you know, can you potentially look at it, leverage microscopy to look at materials from a 3D perspective? So I won't spoil anything. I just thought it was a very intriguing answer. And so that was probably my favorite aspect of the discussion. What about you? Yeah, yeah, I really loved his analogies. So he made two big analogies. The first one, comparing microscopy to astronomy and just how we look at the world around us to understand more about ourselves. And so we look at microscopy as a way to understand materials more fundamentally. I thought that was really interesting. And then he also talked about machine learning and its limits. And I think that a good like idea in our minds about what are the limitations, especially he touches on like chat GPT and like the language learning models, like what is the limit of like what we think is can almost do anything. And so it's a very interesting conversation. And he has so much experience with like data analytics, machine learning, AI, and all this like big data stuff. So he's very knowledgeable and it was just really great to hear from an expert on these topics. So I really enjoyed that aspect. For sure. And be sure to kind of stick stick around for the end because, you know, he has dozens and dozens of years of experience. So you'll want to hear his advice for students and early career professionals in terms of how to really make the most of your career and make career shifts like he did. So without further ado, let's get into the episode. All right. Hello, everyone. Today, we're lucky to introduce Dr. Sergey Kalanin for today's guest. Sergey is a current chair professor at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, who has extensive experience that spans industry, academia, and even national lab settings. Sergey worked as a scientist at Oak Ridge National Lab for nearly 20 years, culminating in his role as the group leader for the Data and Nano Analytics Group. At Oak Ridge National Lab, his work ranged from ferroelectrics to scanning probe microscopy to leveraging ML and AI to enhance microscopy. Sergey also has industry experience at Amazon as a research scientist in Amazon's special project division, also known as Moonshock Factory. His research at UT Knoxville focuses on atomic level fabrication and applying ML and NI to improve microscopy. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you very much, David and Punith. It's a great experience to be able to share these experiences. And I really hope that they would be of interest to you and especially for the listeners of the podcast. Thank you for inviting me. Of course, we're excited to have you and we're lucky to have you. And I know you have a wide variety of experiences that we can dive into. So first of all, let's start off by breaking down exactly what your research focuses on currently and the core problems that you're working to address. How are you able to control fabrication at the atomic level and what value can machine learning and artificial intelligence contribute to these techniques? Fantastic question. Thank you very much for bringing it up. 
So generally, uh, what the North Star for my research is being able to use the microscopy as the way not only to see things, but also to understand and control them. So think about it this way. So for many scientific areas, microscopy was es essentially the foundational elements on what they were built. So in some sense, you can say that biology, or at least microbiology, started from the Van Leeuwenhoek experiments, creating the optical microscope and observing the bacteria and basically giving rise to the modern theory of the diseases and so on and so forth. So in biology, in chemistry, in physics, in material science, microscopy is one of the primary tools. But it is also very common to hear the perception that microscopy just produces images, so we get to see things. We make some conclusions from these images based on what we observe, but at the same time, it is very common to think that it is not a quantitative studies, and that's absolutely not true. So, for example, if you look at the astronomy, astronomy is obviously not an experimental science. So astronomers, thankfully, don't get to do the experiments. However, if you observe the universe and long enough collect the large body of data and use the physics method to figure out what this data mean, you can go all the way to figuring out how the universe is organized, what is the possible history of the universe, discover some interesting things that maybe may or may not exist like dark matter. So in other words, you can actually learn quite a lot based on the observations only. In physical sciences, observation is largely a support tool. The physical sciences are based on the experiment. So we have something, we perform some form of intervention, perform an experiment, we look at the results of this experiment, analyze them, and based on this analysis, we increase our knowledge. So we formulate new hypotheses, we create the theoretical models, and this cycle between the hypothesis making, experiment, theory falsification, serendipitous discovery, and updating a theory is what actually makes the science possible by now. This feedback is actually rooted on the development of the experimental tools. So there was a very famous statement by Freeman Dyson, who mentioned that the revolutions in science are started either by new ideas or by new techniques. And to be honest, techniques seems to be much more often the case. So if we give the new ways, if we get new tools to observe or explore the universe, we typically discover something new. So this being said, basically my vision is to combine these two trends together, to use the microscopy not only the same way how astronomers explore the universe by obviously on the opposite end of spectrum, but also use microscopy to actively manipulate the materials to learn what can we make and what properties that something that we make can have. So this is a vision. So astronomers look at the universe and understand the laws that govern it. I'm interested in looking at the atomic and nanoscale and understand the laws that act, that govern the interaction between the atoms and molecules. So you want to study the different materials, for example, the combinatorial libraries and see how these laws change depending on the physical parameters that we control. So this is our running the experiment. And perhaps the most tantalizing opportunity is to use the electron beams and scanning probes in order to move the atoms around. So we know that they can be moved because that's actually a nuisance which often appears during the experiment. But you know, if you have a, a lemon, sometimes you can make a lemonade out of it. And if you're particularly inventive, you can make actually the lemon cake because if you learn how to control this unwanted phenomena, then you get a capability to actually create the new atomic structures. Sort of another very famous statement is the last statement made by Richard Feynman. The last note of his on his blackboard in Caltech was that I what I cannot make, I do not understand. So there are multiple ways to interpret it as pretty much everything about Feynman. But the way I interpret it is that we will truly try to start to understand physics and chemistry on the atomic scale if we learn to assemble structures atom by atom and measure their properties. And that's exactly what I think microscopy can do now. So so we've seen just in general the the potential for machine learning and, and artificial intelligence, specifically in the material science field. We've had conversations about it in the past, and I just want to see how does 
I want to get your perspective on how that can be leveraged specifically within microscopy to achieve the visions that you were just talking about. So first of all, I think that we are barely scratching the surface of what machine learning can do in the material science and generally in applied sciences. So look at it this way. It's a little bit of the bird eye view, but it's a bird eye view, which is very relevant to predict what is going to happen in the future. It's like a Santayana, if you can understand the future only if you understand the past. So machine learning field as the whole obviously existed for quite a while. But the rapid growth of the last 10 years is associated with the rise of the big IT companies. How did it happen? So before the year 2000, the whole IT world was about what is the value that the internet can bring. So for example, if you use effectively email to order the book and then the post, normal postal system develops it, delivers it to you, that's effectively Amazon. If you use the extended version of the internet or an app to call for a car and then the taxi, the car comes and delivers you where you want to be, that's exactly essentially Uber. If you learn how to send email and search it, that's essentially Google. So these are the capabilities enabled by the spread of the IT technologies. Roughly from 2000 to 2010, or more precisely from, from dot-com crash to maybe 2012, that was the era when the big IT companies formed and started to accumulate large volumes of data. So this is the time when the Facebook basically learned everything there is to learn about the cats on the internet. This is the time when the YouTube, which is the storage for the video started and so on. So by the year 2010, the companies had access to large financial resources, large volumes of data. And they were driven by the motivation to actually do something with this data. I mean, data by itself is useless. You need to understand it and convert it into something that can be either operationalized or monetized or both. And that was exactly the environment in which the deep learning has taken off. So this is the rise of the deep learning starting from Sutskever paper in 2012, a very rapid adoption by industry and the large language models of the last half a year or so. So my personal feeling is that currently we are actually at the limit of this, of this trend for the very simple reason that we're already training the large language models on all the data that is available on the internet. The problem becomes of the operationalization, how we use them in something practical and how we use it for science. But you see, the interesting thing is that the machine learning is essentially data driven. So it is great in finding common trends. It's great to work with what is called the in-distribution problem. But science is absolutely not a big data and in-distribution world. When we do science, we want to go where no one has gone before and uh, discover something new. And interestingly, the classical machine learning can help us do that, but it cannot do it for us because we need to choose the direction by which we go into the unknown. So in the scientific term, it is called, we need to make a hypothesis. We cannot go in all directions at the same time. We need to choose the direction that's likely to be the correct one. We need to run the experiments. So we do the experiments exactly when we don't have data or when we don't have the certainty about the physical loss. So if we know what goes, there is no need to do the experiment. So the, we do the experiment is only when we are uncertain about the results. And by definition, if we do the experiment onto something new, it's not going to generate big data. It can generate large volumes of data, but it is not going to be the big data in the computer sense, which basically means that we need a new types of machine learning in order to analyze that. So the machine learning that comes with a deep causal core, the machine learning that allows us to quantify the uncertainty, and machine learning method that allow us to extrapolate outside of what we know. So microscopy in this case is actually the ideal toy model because first of all, microscopy is an experiment. And secondly, it's an experiment which is uncommonly well controlled. So think about it this way. If you want to build a robot that operates in the environment where there are humans, multiple objects and so on, it's exceptionally complex task, right? So you want to make it safe. You wanted to make it practically useful. You need to make sure that the robot can interact with the humans in the way that is kind of not dangerous for humans or robots for that matter. It's complicated. If you want to build the automated car, it's a great goal. 
it has a well-defined uh, figure of merit. You want to get to point A to point B in least time without the crash. But automated car is a very complex problem. It has to interact with other cars. It has to be safe. It has to do a lot of other things. If you want to use the machine learning in medicine, it's also very complicated because medicine comes with the responsibility. You work with the personal data of people, the conclusion that you make very much relevant to their well-being. You really don't want to make a mistake. And it's not a surprise that prediction uh, several years ago that ML will substitute the radiologist. They, they haven't materialized yet. It's complicated. Now, think about the microscopy. Microscopy, from my perspective, is actually the toy system for all those applications. When I run the microscope, I explore something unknown, but usually the something unknown is fairly constrained. So in the ML language, the number of the exogenous value variables is relatively small. When I do atomically resolved images, I actually know what my objects can be. So my objects can be only atoms. I don't expect to find something unusual like donuts or cucumbers. They don't exist on the atomic level. If I use the electron microscope to manipulate, so as effectively as a robotic arm to move atoms around, I expect that the laws that control how atoms can be manipulated would be much simpler than the laws that control moving the, whatever, assembling the Rubik's cube with the robotic hand. So virtually for all areas of modern machine learning application, if you want to transition from the purely in silica world to the real world, microscopy ends up being the very convenient entry level. So rather than learning how to solve complex models, we can problems, we can start with the simple problems and then scale up. And of course, the side benefit is that we learn how to, what is the physics of the atomic system and how to build matter atom by atom, which is kind of makes it double interesting. Awesome. Yeah, that's a super detailed answer on what kind of where we're at with ML and AI and how it can pave the way for the future. Something we wanted to ask before we dove more into the application for material science specifically is kind of the base technology that you're talking about here, which is the scanning probe microscopy and electron beam formation, which are based on pretty old ideas. I'm curious, for any application of ML and AI, we need to be able to make strong causal links, be able to create these machine learning models that will give us good data. So would you, in your opinion, say that SEM is a solved technology and we know on a very fundamental baseline level everything that SEM would do given all the inputs? Uh, that's a very complex question with the multiple aspects to it. Let's start with the technology because... In principle, technology, the data and science that we build on this data, three components. And in principle, we can use the old technology for developing the new science. There is no problem about it. It at some point will become restrictive and it will become progressively more and more of the bottleneck. But there are ways to do elegant science using, or using the classical technologies. A simple example would be single molecule optical microscopy. So we know that optical wavelength is much larger than molecular size. So one would say that it's impossible to visualize the molecule by optics, but practically it's possible that if you have optical molecule, which is light emitting and the molecules are sufficiently far from each other, then we can do that. We basically engineer the system that allows us to take advantage of the sensitivity of the method and compensate for the fact that the spatial resolution is fairly low. However, this solu these solutions are obviously not universal. It will work in special cases, but not in general. So going back to your question about the technology. So, you know, in uh, each field, there is a thing called the technological debt. So if you make the investment in a certain type of technology, then you are likely to stick with this technology for quite some time. So, for example, in the field of the energy storage, we now have the technological debt with the lithium-ion batteries. So, lithium-ion batteries are great technology for devices and for light EVs. It is a question whether they are good technology for heavy trucks. They are absolutely not the best technology for the grid storage. However, we use them because this is the most mature technology on the market. If you're, if you're an engineer and you have to build the grid storage for a city, you will start thinking with about lithium-ion batteries first and foremost because that comes with the 
best known performance and in some sense lowest risk. So what about microscopy? A microscopy as a field formed long, long time ago, right? So electron microscopy was invented by Ruska in Germany before the World War II in the early 30s. Scanning probe microscopy technically was invented by the folks in the IBM Reichlikon, but the prototypes of scanning probe microscopy can be also traced back to the times before World War II, World War I, by the work of the Herr Doctor Professor Engineer Schmaltz, who basically created the system of the effectively like a cantilever in the probe, except that he used the light rather than laser to reflect it. So these ideas existed for quite a while. And the common thing about these ideas is that you have some probe, either the beam or the mechanical probe that scans across the your surface of interest. So this is common. And now we come to the situation that allowed these technologies to be developed very early on, but by now becomes a technological depth. The first one is that if you have a local probe and you want to generate an image, you sort of need to scan it. And the way you scan it is a raster scan. You basically scan line by line until you get an image. So the same way as the old TVs work and the technical realization of this raster scan is actually relatively straightforward. It is just two function generators giving you the waveform that moves your motors or scanners or your coils that direct your electron beam. So the sufficient subsequent technical development is basically making sure that your beam goes where you want it to be. And so this is a technology. The second trap is the human perception trap. So human eye is exceptionally well-developed tool. So that was instrumental to our survival. And human eye essentially is comfortable with the images which are sampled on the rectangular scan. So there are limits. So for example, we can distinguish 2000 by 2000 pixel images and maybe 4000 by 4000, but we really cannot see anything more than that. And the combination of these two facts that the technologically the raster scanning is easy to realize and the human eye is ideally suited for perception of the normal images that basically created a sweet spot for the microscopy development. Now, how did the life change? So the life has changed in the several regards. So first of all, microscopes are now exceptionally fast. So scanning probe microscopists can scan at the rate of maybe fast scanning would be maybe an image per several seconds. So it's okay. Electron microscopes can scan much faster. So they either can generate the data at the rate that the human eye cannot follow the dynamic changes or they can be created, used to create the images with the exceptionally large number of pixels. For example, I can use the conventional microscope image, which has uh, 32 by 32,000 pixels. So if my eye can recognize objects only in the thousand by thousand pixel image, that means that if I want to find interesting features in this kind of super image, I will have to look at the thousand images. That's kind of you can say that this is cruel and unusual. It's actually a day of work at best. And it's a day of work of the qualified operator because you need to know what you're looking at. Microscopists now can generate the data in the form of the multidimensional spectral data. And humans are not very good in visualizing the high dimensional objects. And they're very difficult to just represent. And most importantly, in many cases, the microscopy can generate the objects which are simply foreign to the way that we operate. For example, some features in the high dimensional spaces that we simply don't e equipped with the proper way of thinking to recognize in the data. So what can machine learning do for us? And I will go as far as to say that we are now in the, this perfect period of the, uh, where the microscopy can be disrupted by the machine learning at all stages. So the trend that already have started is the use of the machine learning to analyze the data after the experiment. So if we have the large data sets or multidimensional data set, machine learning is a great way to analyze it. We are getting somewhere with the deploying the machine learning methods as the part of the experiment. Once we stream the data from the microscope, but we analyze it in real time. And the most interesting thing is that I th we can start to realize, in fact, we are already realizing that machine learning workflows, once we stream the data from the instrument, we analyze it in real time. 
and dependent on what is that that we see, we change our experiment pathway. So what I mean by that is that imagine that we want to study the properties of certain objects in the image, for example, the grain boundary. We trying to do the measurements on the rectangular scan is really not the most effective strategy to do this type of measurement because the interesting properties would be localized in a very small number of objects in the image. So kind of inefficient measurements come with the price because your probe degrade, your sample degrade, the amount of time you spend is much larger. So we can learn more about what we're interested in if we do the measurements only on those grain boundaries. And interestingly, this is an actually an example where machine learning can help us. But what is really interesting is that we can actually already do the things that go well beyond what the humans can do. Because imagine that your task is different. Imagine that your task is that I want to discover what microstructural element in my material or what my what specific atomic groups have the properties that I am interested in. And these properties can be determined as a result of the spectral measurements. Human cannot do this type of experiment. We can do only the grid search. But the machine learning can already run the search algorithm where we look for specific behaviors within the material. What goes next? Scan it one step above. So when I run the microscope, I come there with some sample and idea, what is that that I'm looking at? So I'm not studying the sample for the sake of curiosity most of the time. There is some scientific hypothesis that I'm interested in. For example, how do the grain boundaries affect photovoltaic activity? How would the domain walls affect the electromechanical property? So currently, it is the human operator that chooses the progression of the experiment depending on what you think that you want to study. But I think that the re recent advantages of the recent examples of the expert systems based on the large language models and the advances in techniques such as reinforcement learning, Bayesian optimization, and generally stochastic optimization, they allow us to think about the automated scientists where the human role is to pose the question the human role is to observe the progression of the automated experiment and correct it from time to time, but the instrument will largely drive the process. How disruptive it is going to be? Actually, it is going to be as disruptive as a transition from riding a horse to driving a car, not a bike to the car, because bikes and the cars are almost the same, and they have wheels, they have the, they have the steering wheel, the only difference is that the car has that autonomous engine and then the bike, you are the engine. But the controls and the steering are roughly the same. But transition from the human-driven experiment, an autonomous experiment, is, gives you fundamentally new control. So it's more like getting from the horse onto the car rather than anything else. And I think that it would be really exciting because the technical wherewithals to do that are already in place. Many microscopes have the Python APIs. The machine learning codes to enable many of these operations are available on the GitHub. So basically, I think that's an exceptionally exciting time to be the part of the microscopy community because you simply can go where in the direction which did not exist in the previous hundred years of history of microscopy. Yeah, for sure. And I appreciate the deep dive into that. And I would just love to get your perspective on what these innovations in this microscopy space could look like, you know, so you talked about the rectangular scan. And so I was, I was just wondering, you know, what if you take it a step further, a different dimension, you know, is it possible to render atoms in a 3D plane and analyze it in that space? If, if that's even worthwhile with microscopy using AI and ML and generally taking another step back, a higher level perspective, I want to get your, your thoughts on what improvements automated microscopy could make to the field of material science in terms of accelerating innovation. That's a fantastic question. So again, there are roughly two mechanisms that drive the innovation. One is the curiosity. So a lot of real level one science is actually driven by the curiosity. Some of it is driven by the need when we have the target application. So practically the target application is much more effective driving force. Great example here would be techniques like cryo-electron microscopy. So essentially cryo-electron microscopy is the process when you take the 
solution of the biomolecule is in water, you freeze them in such a way that these molecules are now are frozen in ice and they're fairly far from each other. And then you stick the sample in the electron microscope. And this is something that people have been doing for quite a while and for until maybe 10 years ago. That was not the most rapidly developing area of the electron microscopy because the images that you get is essentially a blob. And studying blobs doesn't feel like a terribly exciting project. Except that there was a natural evolution on the electron microscopy as the result of aberration correction, better cameras, better instrument systems. And at some point, the resolution due to the overall progress in electron microscopy, not in the cryo-EM, got to the point that you start to, to see the atomic details within this block. That become a game changer because now you can visualize the structure of the single biologically relevant molecules. And all of a sudden you can use it for things like development of the drug targets for specific problems. So all of a sudden, the relatively small change in the microscopy resolution brought you to the point that the results of the microscopy become relevant to the huge field of the biology and medicine. So as you can imagine from this moment on, cryo-EM stopped being a little bit of the niche field and become a mainstream field. And there are startups that operate in this area. Companies like AstraZeneca are now investing major amount of funding in the cryo-electron microscopy development. So the curiosity matters, but at some point you need to have the use, use case. So for anything related to the machine learning in microscopy, the use cases will also be the, essentially the engine that will pull, pull, pull the innovation. For example, for atomic manipulation, the key task now, now is to find the field that will benefit most from the atomic manipulation. If we show that it can be used for discovery or for making the solid state quantum computer or quantum emitter, then we can expect this technology to take off big time. If it remains a scientific curiosity, then it will progress because there are groups that feel very enthused by this idea and willing to put time and effort into doing that. But the progress would be relatively small. So we need to find the use case. This is also true for general application of the machine learning and creating of new techniques. The fact that we can do something is the part of the problem. The second part is the motivation and the activation barrier that it will take in terms of investment into technique development to have it done. The good news is that now the activation barrier for this is exceptionally small. And it has been small, interestingly, for maybe two or three years because the revolution has come when the commercial manufacturers start to produce the Python APIs that allowed us to deploy the machine learning algorithms on the existing microscopes. Before that, we had to develop our own controllers. That was a big part of my work in Oak Ridge is to work with a team that actually knew how to do that. And in some cases, it was to kind of hack into the existing microscope systems, which as you can imagine for electron microscope that costs several million dollars and come with a service contract comes with a certain amount of risk. So I was exceptionally lucky to be in Oak Ridge and collaborate with some of the folks who have been at the root of the development of the aberration characters and had technical knowledge required to do this type of operation. So now it is different and it has been different for a very short amount of time. So to kind of wrap on it, the answer to your question, whether it is possible to, let's say, manipulate the atoms in 3D, the answer is yes. So I know that because about six years ago, we observed the motion of the atoms in the 2D in the electron microscope inside the bulk. So notice that uh, the work done on the 2D materials, okay, 2D material is the surface by definition. Atomic manipulation done by scanning tunneling microscopy is also service, surface by definition. But in electron microscope, it's possible to manipulate atoms inside the bulk. And we have a paper a few years ago showing that it's possible to manipulate bithron atoms inside silica. Now, the nice thing about the electron microscope is that you can tilt the sample and get the atomic resolution in a different projection. So at the top of my head, I would say that there is no reasons to believe that is fundamentally impossible to move the atoms in different non-parallel planes. And if you can do that, you can actually move it in 3D. Another option, so this is, this is with the existing technology. 
Now, let's assume that we uh, kind of become very, very optimistic and uh, come to conclusion that there is a strong technological driving force to manipulate atoms in 3D. So, for example, there is a DARPA program or some discovery that says that this is how we can build a true quantum computer. So, in this case, let's assume that our technological capabilities are not limited by the existing tools, but we can invest into the development of new technological base. So a simple solution would be to build the electron microscope with the several columns where two electron beams allow manipulation in the non-orthogonal planes. And the third column is actually used for observation. So since the capability to manipulate matter depends on the beam energy, we can use the high energy beams for manipulation and the low energy beam for observation without destroying material or introducing the beam damage. So the tool like this can cost anywhere from uh, when you build the first one, but you know, it's a huge scale. The question is, what do you compare it for? Right? So this is not something that you can get funded unless there is a specific goal. However, if we know that this particular capability is something that closes our technological cycle towards the viable quantum computer, that's a very different combination, a very different consideration. Yeah, so thank you for the really in-depth explanation about the future of how ML and AI can affect microscopy. One question we had for you was that all you've talked about so far is very academic and natural lab focused. And so you worked at Amazon for a year. And while we understand you may not be able to talk about the exact projects, we are very interested to see how this line of work in general can be worked on at such a large company where usually you don't think of them doing like cutting edge R&D for such a fundamental science such as microscopy. How, how did you apply your skills you learned here to industry? And what are the comparisons between the different fields? This is absolutely fantastic question. And uh, let me start with a little bit with the motivation that basically brought me to Amazon. So about two years ago, I realized that I'm exactly in the middle of my scientific career. So um, at that time I was 44. I had about 700 papers published. I have a kind of sufficient amount of the recognition for this research. And I started to feel that actually what I want to do is to make something that is more impactful in the second half of my career than writing another 700 papers. And of course, staying fully in the national lab environment is actually not the way to do that. So uh, based on interestingly being on some of the award ceremonies and meeting people all over the country, including people from the ML community, I had several contacts in the Google Accelerated Science, Meta and Amazon. So I reached out to them and basically formulated my interest. So I'm interested in doing something that is related to practical application of science. And my motivation for that is that I want to do something that is practically useful. So I get a very interesting a set of interesting interviews in all three companies. Amazon was essentially the first one to give me an offer. And it was very interesting experience because it gave me an opportunity to see the, so basically the place where I was in Amazon was essentially the Moonshot factory. So the Amazon equivalent of the Google X and was started from the Google X. And uh, the purpose of this division was to explore the far out concepts that can potentially become the new big Amazon businesses. So very, very general, very general setting. And uh, that was really a unique opportunity to see how the science scientific idea can be de-risked how it get translated in the technology and how it becomes a product. So both within this division and being in this division gave the, me an access to pretty much all science oriented divisions across the whole of Amazon. So that was really super interesting. Speaking about the, <clears throat> speaking about the skill set, so practically uh, probably 80% of the skill set for the academic science scientists would be transferable to the industrial role. So the capability, so as the faculty or a group leader in the national lab, you already have the management skills that are expected from the a manager in industry. Admittedly, you will very often not have the formal training. So one of the biggest differences in Amazon was that my deal with Amazon was that I stayed there for a year and I'm the individual contributor. 
Amazon spent 20% of my time for effectively management training in the form of usual courses, one-to-ones with the, with the directors and VPs that I work with, with the mentorship, and so on and so forth. So being a man- management training is exceptionally important, and that's the part that is very well developed in industry. In fact, it's absolutely essential for, for the operation of the company as a whole. So as an Amazonian, I know that the way things are done on Amazon is following the Jeff Bezos leadership principle. I know that I can talk to any person that I have never met before who works in a different part of Amazon, like middle mine or marketplace or whatever. And if we have the challenge that is clear how it's positioned across this management principles, we would be able to understand each other. So it's the same language. This is a very unusual aspect, and I'm not sure what are the cultures in other big companies, because mine is obviously limited to Amazon, but I work a lot with the people who come from Google or startups or work in places like Rivian, and it feels like the management culture and the commonality of ideas and goals seems to be something that is very well developed in the industry world. The second thing that is exceptionally interesting is the level of the support and the teamwork that exists in industry. To be honest, that was something that I absolutely did not expect, but industry does operate as a team. There are very effective mechanisms for the feedback and the kind of team building that actually practically work and produces results. So I, in some sense, I'm very lucky to spend a year in industry before starting my group in academia because many of this principle can be incorporated in real time to running the academic group. There is not such a big difference. There are differences. So for example, in industry, job stability is not existent like a class. It's just not there. So when you work in the national lab, you generally expect to have a linear career progression until the time that you are retired. It's not very common to move around. In academia, I mean, sometimes you move to a different university, but generally your trajectory is also straightforward. Industry is very different. So people move in and out all the time. Sometimes it's a a movement associated with a promotion. Sometimes it's a movement associated with being laid off in some form. Now, there are some interesting things here. So, for example, generally you probably cannot get for the mid or senior level in industry and be laid off for the incompetence. I mean, there are exceptions, but generally to be promoted to that level, you already have to demonstrate being competent. No matter your level, you can get laid off when the org that you work in get cut. It has nothing to do with your personal performance. It's just that the whole organization disappears and the decision would be made probably two levels above your immediate line report. So does your performance matter in those cases? Absolutely. It matters because it determines how soon you will get an extra buffer. So in some sense, your personal reputation, your skill sets, your social network is actually how the industry operates. And that's what determines the lateral moves, promotions, and that's what creates your safety net if things don't go right. So that was a super interesting experience. I loved hearing about that. And it's really cool that you were able to contrast your industry experience with, you know, your national lab and academic experience, but there's also a bunch of similarities there. So given your diverse and unique background in academia, industry, and national labs, it's clear that you've always had a desire to challenge yourself and take on new fields and perspectives. So to wrap up this conversation, we would love to hear your advice for material science and engineering students and early career professionals in terms of choosing the field that you end up going into and how to make career shifts like you have in in your background? This is an excellent question and I can share only some of the observations. So the first advice I can give is build your network and build this network early on. So the tool that I discovered myself only when I was in Amazon is the LinkedIn. So generally it allows you to connect to the industry world on multiple levels. So I personally decided that If I have ideas or observations that I feel may benefit someone, I will share them on LinkedIn. So basically within less than half a year, I get to the point of more than 10,000 followers, which probably means that somebody pays attention. But the important thing is that you can use LinkedIn to understand how the industry works. 
to get the feel for how the different companies uh, operate, what is the internal morale, what their, what their preferences and so on. And you can ask for mentorship. There are a lot of people who will be, I mean, for example, the retired executives who would be more than willing to share their experience. I mean, obviously you need to come prepared and with well-formed questions, but they can give you a window in the level of operation of industry that would be simply not available other. So build a social network. LinkedIn is the good way to do that. The great thing about the LinkedIn is that it's available for you anywhere. But obviously, if you live, if you are in Stanford or MIT or any of the, or in UW, so any of the universities that uh, position closely to the geographically localized startup activities, then of course, you can also do it in person. Mm -hmm. So the second thing is kind of try to think outside of the immediate problem that you're interested in. So I would call it the outside context problem. So like, look at it this way. So when I listen to the presentation of the graduate student, or if I read the papers, usually the way the problem is prevent presented is the global problem. For example, global warming, or if you will, building a quantum computing. And then there is a very, very rapid jump to the specific problem that you work on as a part of your thesis or the specific problem solved in the paper. That's absolutely normal and that's the way it should be. But in order to find the industry role, you need to find how to project your skill set, your motivation, and your drive not on the global problem, but sort of see how this connection is being done. So find the people and experiences that you can, can connect to. It's actually very difficult and it's also not very rigid. You need, you would be able to operate within the multiple teams, but you need to learn how to collaborate with the multiple people around you. Very different from the graduate education, because in this case, the focus is actually more on demonstrating that you yourself can pose and answer scientific questions. And one more thing that can be potentially useful is it's a good idea to have a dream. So what is your North Star goal? What is that that you want to accomplish? Obviously, it has to be something that is tangible. So probably none of us can individually can solve the world hunger problem or the global warming. But it's good to have a, a goal like this that basically can drive your career development. Because ultimately, skill set is something that determines whether you're being hired. But this career aspiration and driving force determines the direction in which your career is going. So at any step in, of career, you will have multiple pathways in which you can move. Some of them are up to you. Some of them are driven by chance. In fact, maybe 80% of them would be driven by chance. Whom you have met, whom do you know, where did you apply and where go through the preliminary screening. But ultimately, if you have a trend and direction that guides you, you will find that the choices that you make will kind of align you with this global goal. And that's probably the best thing I can advise. I love that. Those are definitely pieces of advice that we haven't necessarily heard in, in previous episodes. So I appreciate your perspective. And again, super grateful for you joining us today, Sergey. It's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show. And again, thank you so much. We learned we learned so much. I, I really yeah. appreciate it. Thank you very much, Punith and David. And as I said, I would be delighted to follow my own advice. So if you're if the listeners of this podcast want to get in touch, look for me on the LinkedIn. Awesome. Sure. We'll put the link in the description. Thank you. As a materials engineer, we can make an impact in nearly every single industry. But with that versatility comes a lot of different options to choose from. So if you have no idea which industry or position is right for you, believe me, you're not alone. I've been there, done that. But just for a moment, imagine narrowing down your ideal role in company by the end of this week. Imagine being able to secure your dream job offer without having to apply to hundreds of job openings. Our online course, MSE Academy, includes video testimonials, resumes, interview prep, and mentorship from materials engineers who have been in your shoes. We also connect our members with companies and industry professionals in our expansive network to help accelerate your job search as much as possible. To learn more and get started, simply click the link in the description below. And if you enroll within the next 24 hours, we'll add three bonus career development resources. I hope to see you there.